Good afternoon. I'm Palina Sadovska, Eurasia Program Director at Pan America, and uh, together with the Permanent Mission of Lithuania and Human Rights House Foundation and many states who co-sponsored this event, we are welcoming you to the discussion on intensifying threats to media freedom and other human rights in Belarus, culminated in the recent forced landing of Ryanair plane and arrest of the blogger and journalist Raman Pratasevich. This is a side event to the 47th session of the UN Human Rights Council, and we are going to provide our recommendations in regard to Belarus, which is already on the Council's agenda. First, a few housekeeping rules. This event will be recorded and later available on YouTube channels of uh, both Pan America and Human Rights House Foundation. In case you need interpretation to or from Russian, um, it is available and you have to click on the little globe in the bottom menu to choose the language. Please use the chat box to type your questions and we'll have a Q&A session in the end of our event uh, if we have enough time. So I believe uh, we can start now. At the end of last month, uh, the world was shocked by the egregious incident of the Belarusian government's forced landing of a Ryanair plane in Belarus in order to arrest opposition blogger and journalist Roman Pratasevich. While the West was digesting what has just happened on May 23rd, the next day on May 24th, Mr. Lukashenko also seized the moment to pass new legislation effectively ending any remaining independence of media and journalists. We must ask ourselves, what gives Mr. Lukashenko such confidence in thinking that he can so flagrantly violate international norms and human rights? Is it his 26 years in office? Is it the diplomatic and financial support his regime receives from Russia? In any case, if Lukashenko gets away with this, it will be yet another precedent set in terms of what authoritarian leaders can get away with. As we watch abuses happening everywhere from Myanmar to Saudi Arabia and the increasingly lone arm of authoritarianism reaching across borders to silence dissidents, journalists and writers, the international community simply cannot allow this to happen. The Pratasevich case follows a long list of uh, rights violations in Belarus this past year. Since the holding of a sham election in August 2020, Belarus has been experiencing a wide ranging human rights crisis. Pan America's Freedom to Write Index puts Belarus in the top five jailers of writers and intellectuals in 2020. Thus, it is important to remember that violation of media freedom is only a part of the problem in Belarus. Artists, writers, academics, and other intellectuals are in the forefront of this conflict together with media workers. It's also important to remember that the international community must respond to Lukashenko's abuses in ways that do not further harm those fighting for democracy and human rights inside the country. Restrictions on flights in and out of the country, for example, have made it harder for those under threat in Belarus to flee. We will talk about all these issues with our panelists, but also I want to highlight that the 47th session of Human Rights Council will make a decision regarding the renewal of the mandate of the Special Rapporteur on the human rights situation in Belarus. And I hope that this event will make a clear case for the critical need to renew this mandate. Before introducing our panel, we will hear brief opening remarks from the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Lithuania. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank our event co-organizers, Pan America and the Human Rights House Foundation, as well as all co-sponsors for partnering with us in this very important and indeed timely initiative. The still ongoing post-election crackdown in Belarus already amounts to a full-scale frontal attack against all human rights including media freedom. The Belarusian regime continues intensive rep repressions against national and international journalists and media workers who are being harassed, intimidated and detained arbitrarily. Allow me to draw your attention to the gravity of the situation by providing some facts. To begin with, almost 500 journalists, bloggers and media workers were arrested last year. This year, almost 140 incidents, including arrests, detentions, and acts of violence against journalists have been reported by the Belarusian Association of Journalists. 
25 journalists remain in custody just for doing their work, for presenting unbiased information to the society. Some of them, as Andrzej Pachobut, are in difficult health condition without proper medical care. The Belarusian regime is taking deliberate actions to eliminate independent media and the ability of Belarusian citizens to access information. In May, the last remaining independent media outlets were harassed and eventually closed, including Tut BIY, which was one of the most prominent free media portals in Belarus. Mass media law is the most repressive in Europe and turns Belarusian journalists' work into minefield. According to 2021 World Press Freedom Index, published by Reporters Without Borders, Belarus is already the most dangerous country in Europe for journalists. I would like to quote five UN special reporters who have recently called Belarus a black hole for media freedoms. What is more, the regime is actively targeting independent Belarusian media and journalists outside of Belarus. On May 23rd, Ryanair flight from Athens to Vilnius was forced to divert to the Minsk National Airport in what the international community has condemned as a spon state-sponsored hijacking. The Belarusian regime subsequently detained a passenger, journalist and polit political activist, Raman Pratasevich, together with Sofia Sapega. It is widely thought that the possibility to detain them was the real reason behind the forced plane diversion and endangering civil aviation. This shocking act is yet another blatant attempt of Alexander Lukashenko's regime to silence all indep independent media voices by using all means. Furthermore, Lithuania is very concerned about possible use of torture, inhuman or degrading treatment as means to extract so-called confessions of Raman Pratasevich and Sofia Sapega. International community must urge the Belarusian regime to refrain from the use of force against journalists and media workers, to stop arbitrary arrest and detention, and demand for immediate release of those detained. International community must send a clear message to the Belarusian authorities that all perpetrators of grave human rights violations, including torture, inhuman or degrading treatment, and enforced disappearances will be brought to justice. Lithuania underlines the urgency to com combat impunity in Belarus and supports the coordinated efforts to hold those responsible for acts of repressions to account. Effective international and independent accountability and monitoring mechanisms are being created, including the mandate of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, requ requested by the Council in its resolution 46-20. There can be no impunity for perpetrators of human rights abuses. Furthermore, continued international scrutiny for the worsening human rights situation in Belarus should be maintained. To this end, in the current session of the Human Rights Council, we expect extension of the mandate of the Special Rapporteur on the situation in Belarus for a period of one year and request the Special Rapporteur to continue to monitor developments and make recommendations. I would like to express here the great appreciations for dedicated work done by Special Rapporteur Anai Marin and her predecessor. We should be vocal and clear in urging the Belarusian side to cooperate fully with the UN special procedures, including to provide access to visit country. Lithuania stands in solidarity with the imprisoned journalists and all arbitrary and unlawful detained in Belarus. We see many other countries sharing this position and we want to call on others to react to the shocking situation where big violations are performed in small steps. Let us not be complacent with that latter as the former are unforgivable. I hope this side event will contribute to the liberation of victims and eventually to freedom and democracy in Belarus. I thank you. Thank you, Minister, uh, for these important uh, remarks and for being such a great ally for uh, Belarus. I now turn to the first of our panelists, the Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights Situation in Belarus. During the previous session of Human Rights Council, the Council requested the High Commissioner for Human Rights to carry out a comprehensive examination of all alleged human rights violations committed in Belarus since May 1, 2020, including the possible gender dimensions of such violations, with a view to contributing accountability for perpetrators and justice for victims.
This is a very important and timely initiative, and we encourage the international community to further support the High Commissioner's Accountability Mandate. Madam Special Rapporteur, we are grateful for your participation. As I mentioned earlier, um, the Council session will also discuss the renewal of your mandate, and together with our colleagues from Belarusian Civil Society, we fully and wholeheartedly support that renewal. I would ask you if you could provide us with a brief update on the human rights situation in Belarus since you last updated the Council in uh, March this year. Madam Special Rapporteur, you have the floor. Um, thank you very much. Um... Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak at this important event, focusing on one of the most <clears throat> pressing issues in Belarus today. I'm glad to see an impressive lineup of experts and practitioners, including many brave Belarusians standing up for human rights. Last year, we all witnessed a significant escalation of human rights violations in Belarus, which climaxed, <clears throat> excuse me, in the aftermath of the disputed presidential election of 9th August and is not receding. The political crisis and related surges in human rights violations once again revealed deep-rooted institutional problems in Belarus, where the law enforcement and the justice system are structurally instrumental to curtail human rights rather than to protect and promote them. While the authorities launched a full-scale assault against a broad spectrum of human rights. I am particularly concerned by the systematic targeting of journalists, media workers and bloggers, as it led to further restricting the rights to freedom of opinion and expression. The limitation of freedom of the media has been a central issue of concern for my mandate since it was established in 2012. It takes the form of systematic use of censorship and self-censorship administrative hurdles, financial checks and harassment by taxation authorities, total state control over the means of dissemination of printed media, political pressure and intimidation against independent media outlets and journalists. These have been commonplace, unfortunately, in Belarus for years. However, what we saw last year was unparalleled in terms of scale and intensity. And this coordinated attack on media freedom continues to this day. The crackdown included, for example, in August 2020, several days of internet disruptions, which the authorities attributed to a foreign cyber attack, while specialists considered that they resulted from deliberate state interference meant to prevent people from seeking or spreading information and evidence about the violent dispersal of protesters who were in majority peacefully protesting against what they perceived as manipulated vote results. Dozens of foreign journalists were then expelled from Belarus for allegedly being biased and having caused, I quote, mass disruptions to public order, unquote. They all lost their accreditation and none of them has been able to return to Belarus after that. Local media workers were treated even more harshly. While crushing protests demonstrations and peaceful marches in solidarity with those beaten and arbitrarily detained, the riot police, special forces and their surrogates applied indiscriminate force against media workers as well. Many journalists were injured while performing their professional duties. At least 62 of them were subjected to violence or ill treatment in 2020. Others were arrested, detained and ill treated without distinction to their profession. As a result, in the 2020 edition of its World Press Freedom Index, Reporters Without Borders ranked Belarus 153rd out of 180 countries. By 2021, Belarus has dropped in that index further down to the 158th place. Due to a fundamentally non-conducive media environment, many Belarusian outlets and individual journalists shifted to electronic media notably internet-based media and social networks, including YouTube channels and Telegram chats. However, these two have been targeted by the authorities. For example, the Ministry of Information accused the news agency Tutbai of spreading inaccurate information that could harm public interests and suspended its status of media 
for three months as of 1st of October 2020. Later that month, Telegram-based popular channel Mierta was labeled by the authorities as extremist. According to the Code of Administrative Offenses, just reposting its materials could subject authors to fines. The government called upon Poland to extradite the administrators of Nexta. Facing refusal, the authorities found a cunning way of reaching their goals, as the whole world has seen. Mr. Landbergis recalled that I joined other UN special procedure mandate holders in issuing a public statement on 7th of June, condemning the reckless manner in which Roman Protasevich was arrested and uh, reports that this social media activist may have been tortured in order to extract a false confession, that he was denied access to his lawyer and fears that he could face a harsh sentence. I would like to use this opportunity and express my sympathies to Raman Pratasevich's parents, to Natalia Petrovna, who is with us today, and to his colleagues from the journalistic profession. Raids, searches, interrogations, and other forms of pressure and intimidation of media workers have continuously intensified since 2020. On 14th of January, the editorial office of Belapan was subjected to a search ostensibly in connection with a probe against a former employee, journalist Andrei Alexandrov, who was charged with having participated in post-electoral protests. On 16th of February, the authorities conducted mass raids against the offices of several media outlets, allegedly as part of a criminal investigation into actions that, quote, grossly violate public order. And on 18th of May, the Belarusian authorities closed down the largest private media platform in the country, Tutbai. Access to the website was blocked. Uh, the offices and private apartments of journalists were raided. Equipment and hard disks were seized. And at least 13 Tutbai staff have been detained. All were charged under uh, the Criminal Code of Belarus for tax evasion. As of today, 25 media representatives remain in detention, including two Belsat journalists sentenced under criminal articles to two years in prison. Eight more who are suspecting criminal cases and two are uh, sentenced to administrative arrest. All this only for doing their job, speaking the truth and upholding the ideal that the Belarusian authorities should comply with international human rights standards. I would like to stress uh, yet another trend contributing to the deterioration of the situation pertaining to freedom of expression in the media. In recent months, the authorities have further tightened an already very restrictive legislation in an attempt to legalize post hoc violations that occurred in the run up to and in the aftermath of the election. I'm referring here mostly to the amended laws on mass media on countering extremism and against the rehabilitation of Nazism. As a result, organizations and individual enterprises can be closed down on grounds of extremism, which remain, remain ill-defined. Media covering events deemed terrorist would be liable for advocating extremism. As we have seen in recent months, the crackdown on freedoms of opinion and their expression has included a ban in practice on displaying white, red, white flags in private homes. Those who did so were fined or imprisoned for allegedly organizing unlawful mass events. Under the new legislation, posting pictures of these flags in social media can be prosecuted as advocating extremism. Ladies and gentlemen, the aspects I just recalled illustrate how Belarus systematically violates Article 19 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights that guarantees to everyone the right to hold opinions without interference and to express them freely, including the freedom to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas of all kinds through any media of his or her choice. Furthermore, the government violates Article 33 of the Constitution of Belarus, which also guarantees to everyone freedom of opinion, belief, and expression, 
and prohibits state monopoly on mass media and censorship. I call upon the Belarusian authorities to review the legislative base and bring it in line with Belarus's international human rights obligations and commitments. I also urge the authorities to immediately and unconditionally release all the journalists and bloggers who have been detained or imprisoned, to drop all the charges against them, and put an end in law and in practice to censorship, harassment, intimidation, and prosecution against media workers engaged in their professional activities. I hereby thank the diplomats and activists who tirelessly convey this message, and I hope that it will be heard and acted upon sooner than later. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Special Rapporteur, for this um, updates and for giving us a, a perspective um, of uh, how much the situation worsened in the latest months and uh, the about the systematic uh, manner of uh, human rights violations in Belarus. We have already mentioned uh, Raman Pratasevich's case a few times today. We were hoping that Raman's mother, Natalia, would join us today, as an, um, uh, Madame Special Rapporteur mentioned. Unfortunately, at very late notice, she has decided it is not possible for her to speak for very understandable reasons. However, Olga Salamatova, expert on Belarus from Helsinki Foundation of Human Rights, uh, has agreed to step in at a late notice and present an update on the situation. Ms. Salamatova, you have the floor. Uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy to be present at such an important meeting. Without uh, repeating previous points, I will proceed to the, to the main idea. Protasevich and Sapega case should be seen in the general context of large scale and systematic human rights violations. It's important to stress some, some points illustrating this whole situation. Madame Anais Marin has already said that about the nature of this detention, which unprecedentedly breaches multiple standards, which has shocked the international community. However, it was also said that an independent lawyer was not allowed to see him for a long time. And it is also important to note that the lawyers working on the case on, of Raman and Sofia Sapega are not allowed to disclose anything. So they have signed the, the promise not to disclose anything. They cannot share any information in any word. If a, if a lawyer says any word which is uh, considered by authorities to be redundant will cause the license to the lawyers. So they can be disbarred. And this is a practice that we see in Belarus, which stresses the vulnerability of both Roman and Sofia and people who defend them. How my today's intervention also illustrates that uh, relatives of political prisoners, their family members, uh, friends, and loved ones are under permanent pressure, just like those people who are in prisons. And family members live in uncertainty, which causes huge concern and lack of security their feelings and perceptions, especially if you are in Belarus. During the first days after detention, when family members try to find the political prisoners abducted in streets, it's a very different situation. But later, such uh, moments reoccur in the course of the proceedings. And now we are going through a situation when we don't know the whole information about where Raman and Sofia are. And uh, I believe that in the nearest future, we will see one more video. Probably this will be the fourth video on which Raman will be exploited as a statist uh, actor, because uh, this, uh, these videos should be seen is a form of pressure and a certain form of torture against a victim of human rights 
violation. The situation now is that uh, probably authorities of Belarus will be willing to show the situation is changing for the better. However, as it has been repeatedly, the form might be changing, but the essence is not. Both Roman and Sofia stay charged and under full control of the government. And um, they also have criminal charges on them. And even with, if we see them walking down the street and these uh, scenes already are re reappearing and emerging they are portrayed if they are, if they are walking free it doesn't change the situation in fact which means that the authorities have to be demanded full stop of for crackdown and uh, repression and pressure on all political prisoners including roman and sofia we can only say the situation has changed when they are safe and uh, only once uh, this, this minimum requirements put to Belarusian authorities are met. So far, we have not seen any findings of medical examination of Roman and Sofia about what has happened to them. And one more thing I would like to reiterate. We know, and the Belarusian government has shown demonstratively to the rest of the world that conversations are video and audio recorded. The, I mean, confidential conversations of lawyers with their clients. We have seen it in Tikhanovsky case, and uh, we have seen it uh, during the press conference, in which they brought Roman Protasevich under duress. We found, we heard again that the conversation of the consul to the nationals of uh, their country were being wiretapped and recorded, which leaves no doubt that there is not a single minute that people like Roman Protasevich, who, who express their opinion and show the world what is happening in Belarus, while they are in full control of the authorities, they are under this control 24-7. So even when they meet a lawyer, we can't call these meetings confidential. This is what uh, highlights the situation and it shows how important it is for us to stay engaged with all mechanisms and how important it is to have the mandate of the special rapporteur on belarus continued and to demand that the repressions in belarus are stopped thank you uh, Natalia Protasevich can watch us today and feel all the support from our participants to her and uh, her family in this very grave situation. Our next speaker is Belarusian journalist, uh, a recipient of Václav Havel uh, Journalism Fellowship and World Press Institute Fellowship, Hanna Lubakova, who has been tirelessly reporting and tweeting about the situation on the ground uh, since the events of August 2020 and long before. Ms. Lubakova, on the uh, next day after Roman Pratasevich arrest, um, Belarus passed new legislation that prohibits live coverage in the media of mass events, including online streaming, and introduces further restrictions on the work of media. Can you please give us uh, some other examples of the recent violations of the freedom of press and your assessment of what, in your view, is the role of Human Rights Council and its member states in protecting independent media in Belarus? Uh, thank, in you. thank you, Paulina, and thank you for organizing this uh, timely discussion. I think it could not have been a more relevant day to discuss the situation with media freedom in Belarus. Um, and let me just give you three examples of why today. Firstly, uh, today the uh, trial over prominent bloggers, Sergei Tikhanovsky, Igor Losik, other bloggers uh, has, uh, has begun. It's a closed trial. Uh, the audience was not allowed in the courtroom. Secondly, uh, today another trial that would eventually uh, kind of try to recognize stood by a website, stood by media outlet and its social networks as extremist has already begun. Um, thirdly, a criminal trial over another journalist, Sergei uh, Gardievich, has started in the Brest region. He is being accused of insulting Lukashenko. 
and that's just one day in the life of Belarusian journalists. Um, previous speakers have already mentioned um, a wider context, but, but, but let me just uh, kind of repeat it perhaps again. Um, last year, the regime has started a real war against journalists, and this is not an exaggeration. Last year, 70 websites have been blocked, and the uh, kind of pressure on independent, on non-state media uh, has been steadily increasing. Um, we have, we all know these numbers, nearly 500 journalists were detained. Currently, there are 25 journalists who remain in jail, including my friends, Katerina Andreeva and Daria Chultsova, uh, by, which was read by two thirds of the population in Belarus has been practically demolished. Roman Protasevich, blogger and journalist, um, ha has been detained last month. Um, and in the past five months of this year, Belarus has, um, basically half a year, Belarus has already adopted a number of laws that significantly restrict civil uh, civil rights and media freedom in Belarus. Um, you, you mentioned, Balina, that journalists were um, prohibited from reporting, from live streaming, um, from an unauthorized demonstration, mass event. Uh, all of them are kind of not sanctioned, not allowed anyway, um, which means that journal journalists simply cannot report uh, from the streets live. Um, another um, kind of legislation, another step that I, I want to mention is this idea of Alexander Lukashenko to, um, to copy this Russian um, foreign agent, agents law. Um, and this is going to, to further restrict media freedom in Belarus. And sadly, all of this is becoming the new normal. And what I think we have to now understand, understand that the consequences and the scale of this strategy um, is, um, is unbelievable. It's more, I think, that we can actually imagine because the regime is not only detaining journalists or bloggers, the, re the regime is not only destroying media outlets, but the regime is destroying the whole infrastructure in ecosystem of media and independent journalism in Belarus and cleansing the uh, media field from high quality professional objective journalism uh, will eventually uh, form serious um, imbalances in society, the consequences of which are, are really hard to predict. It means that uh, both people inside the country and outside the country would have little information, little understanding about what's happening. Um, and another reason, another consequence, is, uh, which is very important, is that um, once the ecosystem is destroyed, um, we have um, kind of, it's easier for foreign countries to spread their propaganda, to spread their false narratives in Belarus. That's why we have to save um, independent journalism and media um, in the country. And here um, I'd like to propose several steps how, how it should might be done. Um, it's crucial that I'll start with solidarity because that's something that, that, that still is important. Um, international organizations and national governments should take a firm stance on, on, on what's happening in Belarus and be vocal about the repressions. Um, Belarusian journalists need more tangible steps as well. I um, Something that we've been thinking and about is creating this emergency program to support free media in Belarus. And whenever I speak to journalists, they usually say that this should include legal aid for uh, journalists who, who face prosecution or imprisonment. Um, even, well, they have to pay lawyers, even these fees kind of are very expensive in Belarus. And that's something that, that they need support with. Um, they need technical assistance um, for those media that already exist. Um, and this would include equipment as well. Only recently I was asked by someone who, um, whose laptops were con confiscated and, and this editorial newsroom, a small one in Minsk, they just need two laptops, right? So, so journalists constantly need equipment because it's been confiscated, it's been destroyed. Uh, they need a censorship, a convention tools. They need a relevant software uh, for, for this. Um, Journalists who flee the country, who want to relocate in fear of prosecution, need visa support with this. They need um, kind of help with relocation in general. Um, and um, those outlets, so I mentioned those outlets that already exist, but there are also newly emerging 
um, excellent social media networks, uh, YouTube, Telegram channels that also need support. And regional media um, uh, need kind of another kind of special, I would say, support because um, they, um, they are also being destroyed and people in the regions are left without access to information. And obviously investigative and fact-checking journalism need, need kind of our special attention, our special support because people also need it. When it comes to international media organizations, uh, uh, they could help press organizations in Belarus by providing infrastructure for this assistance, for this, for this assistance, this support. Um, they need to constantly raise the issue of arrested journalists, um, and they would need to lobby, right, um, for for this support, for for kind of um, for the support generally for for, for Belarus uh, in their respective countries, and. The last point I would make is that um, um, I believe that um, this is kind of not enough to focus only on media. We need to solve the crisis in Belarus in general, and political prisoners should be released, uh, violence should be stopped, and new elections should be organized this year. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lubakova, and I think it's a, it's a very uh, good link to our next speaker. Um, I turn now to Executive Director and Vice President of Pan Belarus, Tasiana Nedbay. For quite some time, Pan Belarus has been monitoring and documenting violations of cultural rights in Belarus, a country where the Belarusian language itself is under attack from the government. In 2000. Uh, 20, the number of these violations reached a peak of 593 violations of rights of artists, writers, and cultural workers, including arrests and brutal detentions for artistic expression. Pan America's Freedom to Write Index also found that at least 18 writers and public intellectuals were held in prison for an extended period in Belarus during 2020. Ms. Nidbai, what is your assessment of the cultural freedom in the country right now and how the situation changed in the last year? Ms. Nidbai, you have the floor. Good afternoon to everybody. Thank you, Paulina, for your question, for the interest to this sphere, this group of uh, cultures of figures. I have to say that uh, really culture figures found themselves at the front uh, line of the protests and, uh, you know, their participation of, you know, both creators like musicians, artists, poets, singers, but also as ordinary citizens who did not want to put up with lawlessness and violence. But we must not forget that they are also opinion leaders and they have influence uh, over other people. Creative people have always been in the, at the forefront of the protest as 30 years ago when uh, Nobel Prize winner Svetlana Alexievich, uh, her teacher Alessia Damovich, another founder of the Belarusian pen, uh, Vladimir Arlov and many other um, culture figures uh, came to the forefront of uh, protests for independence and democracy. So today it is really important for the people to hear the voice of cultural heroes and you know, people with moral authority and their position, their voice, their opinion is very important for hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, that is why I thank you for your attention to this group of people and I would like to to thank uh, colleagues who uh, spoke about the situation in the mass media sphere. I could say a lot about mass media, but I would focus on the figures of culture. And I should give you a couple of words about the context uh, because the authorities realized the importance of the words of culture figures. And for many dozens of years, they tried to split the community into loyal and disloyal ones. As with journalists, we have two unions, the Pro-State Journalist Union and the Belarusian Association of Journalists, which is independent. Also, we have two unions of writers, the state and independent ones. Uh, authors of the state-run organizations uh, uh, had the opportunity to perform in schools and universities, others uh, must obtain special consent. And in practice, they never received it. Books uh, written by the undesired, uh, disloyal to the authorities, authors did not get into libraries, are not published by state publishing houses. Uh, and uh, state propaganda and state media, even if they mention the names of disloyal authors, do not uh, uh, do it only in a, a derogatory context. Uh, and, uh, you know, the names, uh, they call an independent artist, uh, 
are insulting professional and personal dignity, and it would be considered an insult uh, by any independent court, but not in Belarus, of course. And uh, what Olga Salamatova said, you know, we have, we're kind of uh, lucky to have direct evidence uh, from the authorities, uh, for instance, uh, when they record conversations of lawyers with their clients, and here we also have direct evidence that the state does not support the authors uh, who criticize the state. The state actually says uh, uh, out loud, like, why, do we, why should we pay uh, the artists who criticize us, as if uh, they are paying it uh, not from the taxes of people, but from uh, their personal pockets. And of course, the authors, you know, use the crowdfunding mechanisms uh, um, they learned to use it, uh, but uh, last year the mechanism, uh, crowdfunding platforms uh, were shut down, and now any funding of any creative initiatives could be considered as funding of protest activities. And actually, according to our law enforcement practice, uh, any act of uh, pro uh, you know, any statement that disagrees with the position of the government can be considered an act of protest or even an act of extremism. Uh, due to that, uh, self-censorship has intensified, especially among those people who do not want to leave Belarus, who want to stay in the country. Uh, they, people remove protest content uh, from their books. Sometimes, uh, you know, it seems that, you know, nothing special is there, but still uh, they try to, to do that. Uh, also, the uh, pro government propaganda telegram channel accused Belarus, Pan Belarus of fascism, appealing to one of the awards presented by Pan Belarus, uh, because the patron of the award is a Belarusian poet who was forced to go abroad during the Second World War. Uh, but the propaganda calls her a collaborator, citing absolutely false facts, uh, providing fake evidence. But the truth is that the law enforcement agencies of Belarus are not interested in the truth today. Everything critical of the authorities is being destroyed, taken away from the public sphere, anything that can show other people that there are still dissenting opinions in Belarus. And here, along with the crackdown of the street protests, there was the turn of journalists and art figures, you know, those who gave people information and those who spoke in the voices of thousands of people for hundreds and thousands and millions of other people. What's happening today? Of course, uh, you know, people lose their jobs uh, uh, when they participate in uh, videos against uh, violence uh, that happened in August and September last year. Uh, lots of fines, uh, lots of people had to flee the country. Uh, people get uh, sentences, uh, prison sentences, uh, bookshops, libraries, uh, theaters are closed. Uh, recently a performance, a play, Oh, where one of the members of the Coordination Council took part in uh, was shut down because 10 minutes uh, into the start of the play, uh, police came and arrested uh, actors and, uh, and viewers. Uh, and all other kinds of state propaganda in state mass media. So the authorities are trying to silence people, organizations, and just uh, cleans uh, the cultural field. Already eight organizations, among them, uh, Pan Belarus, uh, Belarus Association of Journalists, IFAMOS, an organization engaged in the restoration of cultural heritage. Also Zveno, an organization that among other things, uh, organizes exhibitions and uh, documentary festivals, received requests from the Ministry of Justice to provide documents to verify their comply compliance uh, with the Belarusian law. And that's like thousands of documents. I would like to give you one metaphor. In uh, 2006, uh, when after the rigged elections in Belarus, there was a tent camp in October Square, and then the police attacked uh, at night the tent camp, and all the people were arrested and taken to a place in the jail. A lot of uh, their belongings just stand, uh, stayed there. Uh, uh, at the square. Uh, this was all taken away by dump trucks. Uh, among these things, there was my backpack uh, with documents and notes because I was a student. In a couple of months, the police uh, called me and said that they found my student card. So I was kind of 
considering it as a joke maybe because you know out of all my things they just kind of found only my student card but now i have a feeling that soon uh, from us from organizations from people who want to stay in belarus who would like to work in belarus the only thing that is left of us is just you know fragments of some papers accidental papers thank you thank you Ms. Midway, um, um, for for all your courage your advocacy and uh uh, all the work you do, emergency work that you do to help cultural um, cultural figures in Belarus and for, for courage to stay in Belarus as well. Um, so uh, finally, I turn to Matthew Jones, uh, International Advocacy Officer um, of the co-organizer of this event, Human Rights House uh, Foundation. Um, Mr. Jones, Human Rights House Foundation has been doing work in Belarus for um, a lot of years. Uh, being based in Geneva, you've been um, able to see from inside how the attitude towards Belarus has been changing um, at the Human Rights Council in recent years. Can you share with us what the dynamic is right now and what would be your recommendations to the 47th session of the Human Rights Council in regards to Belarus? You have the floor. Thank you, Polina. Um, and thanks to uh, PEN America uh, and the other co-sponsors and of course, my fellow panelists. Um, Human Rights House Foundation is glad to participate in what is a very timely event, particularly when we consider uh, the Human Rights Council session uh, and the consideration of the renewal of the mandate. Um, excellencies, colleagues, uh, before I start, I just want to acknowledge, um, as I have in the past, Belarusian civil society, um, the human rights defenders, the lawyers, the journalists, the media representatives, our colleagues and our friends. They continue to act under immense pressure with dignity and with courage. And of course, this event that we're participating in today and our work at the council, ultimately it's about supporting their frontline work to defend and protect the human rights of people in Belarus. Um, and we certainly today in this event stand in solidarity with them. Uh, and so just in the interests of time, I really want to focus on some key recommendations. Um, of course, we're here in Geneva. Um, we're thinking about the work of the council, which is in process at the moment. Um, and, and, you know, we've already heard, of course, some of the immense challenges that Belarusians are facing at the moment. Um, the challenges are various, but we also have a chance to act. And so some straightforward recommendations um, as I see them. First, uh, I, as um, Polina mentioned, um, HRHF and, and even me personally um, have worked alongside Belarusian civil society and the mandate for the UN Special Rapporteur for many years. Um, I've seen firsthand how important the mandate is to civil society in the absence of local and regional opportunities for raising human rights. Um, let's not forget, Belarus is not a member of the Council of Europe, unlike all, all other countries in the region, so that there is simply no means by which Belarusians can seek recourse for serious human rights violations at a domestic or a regional level at the moment. So really, the UN is it. Um, and the special rapporteur in that regard is in incredibly important to civil society. Um, in addition, the special rapporteur serves a complementary role to the, the, the new UN accountability mechanism that was created in March. Um, the mandate, of course, addresses violations outside of the time frame of the accountability mechanism. Um, it also, the, the mandate also analyzes longer term trends and the underlying causes of the, the violations that we're seeing at the moment. Um, so it's really essential that, um, first of all, that delegations um, who are with us today, that you take the opportunity to engage in the interactive dialogue um, with the special rapporteur. Um, of course, you know, if it's down to Belarus, not only would Belarus itself not engage with the special rapporteur, but we know that they actively encourage other delegations not to engage. Um, and so this is really a moment actually to be engaging with her mandate and to be very clear about the current issues. Um, and of course, also when the uh, resolution comes before the council um, uh, to ensure that it passes and the mandate is renewed. Second, it's important that the Human Rights Council, which uh, approved uh, the new accountability mechanism um, uh, back at the last session, and by the way, it, it, an incredibly important and, and necessary new mechanism, 
Um, and, and, and also, by the way, I'm pleased to see that the, the High Commissioner's Office has gotten it operational as quickly as it has. Um, you will have all seen uh, the High Commissioner's appointment of um, three um, uh, very notable international experts who will assist that mechanism. And, and so that's really good and it's important. And, and it's good that the, the work is, is getting up and running um, quickly. But it's important too that we, um, the international community and delegations, that we continue to assist this mechanism to ensure that it's able to conduct its work as efficiently and effectively as possible. Um, thirdly, um, let us think too of other arenas in uh, Geneva and in New York where we can be encouraging a focus uh, on Belarus. Um, I, um, I'm aware that the um, International Labour Conference last week, the ILO has had a focus on Belarus. This is good, it's important. Um, let's also think about other avenues um, at a UN level where we can be uh, raising Belarus. Fourthly, let's think about cooperating with um, other um, mechanisms, other regional uh, platforms where Belarus is a focus. And, and I'm particularly thinking um, of the International Accountability Platform for Belarus, which is led by um, INGOs like Dignity, um, by Belarusian NGOs like Vyazna, really important that we you know, ensure as much as possible that there's a kind of coordination, strategic cooperation between the, the different platforms and the mechanisms. And then finally, um, let's also think about the wider regional context. Um, and, I, and I'm thinking particularly of other international organizations like the OSCE. Now, not, not all of the delegations on the call, of course, are members of the OSCE as well, but it does have, as an international organization, an important role to play when it comes to not just actually raising um, the, the serious human rights violations in Belarus, but also thinking about these kind of more political questions, you know, seeking some sort of a political dialogue and ultimately a political um, a, a solution to the, to the challenges that Belarus is facing. So it's just an encouragement, particularly those delegations who are engaged in Vienna, to be really thinking collaboratively and strategically with those delegations and, and in a collaborative and cooperative fashion to make sure that we're making the most of the opportunities when it comes to raising Belarus and, and to seeking some solutions. Um, so I'll leave it at that. I know there's, we, we've got many others who, who want to take the floor, but it's just really a focus, first of all, on the council, then on the wider UN system, then regionally um, with other platforms and ultimately looking to build those links with other international organizations as well. It's really a pleasure to be alongside um, these fellow panelists today, um, Polina, and I, I hand back the floor to you now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jones, and uh, um, I can say that Pan America will be uh, will happily sign for each of his uh, under each of his recommendations. So you um, definitely um, can count on us. Um, so that completes the lineup of panelists that we have. Hopefully, we'll have time for a few interventions after the statements by our co-sponsors. But now I turn to the first statement by the permanent mission of the United States. You have the floor. It is my honor to address you on behalf of the United States on the topic of media freedom and freedom of expression in Belarus. The United States continues to be deeply concerned by the Belarusian authorities' continuing attacks on human rights and international law. Despite being in the heart of Europe, Belarusians have not enjoyed the freedoms that many of their neighbors enjoy, and conditions have only worsened in the past year as Lukashenko has cemented his legacy as a dictator at the head of an authoritarian, unrepresentative government. His regime recently shocked the international community when it forcefully diverted a Ryanair flight traveling between two EU member states to arrest journalist Raman Pradesevich and his companion Sofia Sepega. The regime hit a new low on June 14th by parading Pradesevich clearly under duress before a press conference. All told, these incidents are a worrying sign that the regime is willing to take extreme measures to stay in power, including further silencing the media. Since the fraudulent August 2020 elections, the regime has not only cracked down on peaceful protesters, youth, and women activists, some 400 journalists and media workers in Belarus have faced various forms of repression. The regime has heavily restricted access to information, 
and it continues to lead a brutal and sustained campaign to target and harass journalists, including those from foreign media organizations. The regime now holds over 500 political prisoners, many of them in squalid and harsh conditions. Many are reportedly being tortured. The United States calls on the Belarusian authorities to release now and without conditions all those unjustly detained or imprisoned. This includes the many journalists and media workers who have been arbitrarily detained. We also call on the Belarusian authorities to hold accountable those responsible for the despicable attacks on journalists and media workers. This includes repealing the passage of recent laws that penalize journalism and restrict free speech. What are the authorities afraid of? What are they afraid might be revealed if the truth is shared? I know I'm in good company when I say today, journalists in Belarus must be able to enjoy a free, safe, and enabling environment to work without interference. Media freedom is an essential part of democratic societies. Access to uncensored information is vital for citizens, especially in turbulent times. There should be no doubt the United States and people across the world are with the people of Belarus. That is why, together with our partners and allies, we have sanctioned Belarusian officials involved in human rights violations and abuses. On June 21st, the United States, the UK, Canada, and the European Union took additional coordinated action by announcing new sanctions on Belarusian officials to promote accountability and demonstrate our commitment to supporting the aspirations of the people of Belarus. We will continue to bring new tools of pressure to bear as needed. We will continue to bolster assistance to those advocating for democracy and standing up for human rights in Belarus. And we fully support renewing the mandate of the Special Rapporteur on the situation in Belarus. We thank Agnès Marin for her continued service in that role. The situation in Belarus concerns us all. The recent Ryanair incident makes it clear the Lukashenko regime's disregard for international norms can threaten security in Europe and beyond. I'd like to close by reaffirming the United States is committed to confronting this threat in coordination with like-minded countries and by renewing our call on the regime to pursue dialogue with all sectors of society to hold free and fair elections. Thank you. Thank you, permanent mission of the United States. Uh, next goes permanent delegation of the of European Union, followed by permanent mission of Denmark. You have the floor. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, this is a timely and urgent debate. The Belarusian regime has shown that it will go very far to suppress the freedom of opinion and expression, both online and offline. This was recently illustrated by the scandalous forced landing of an EU civilian aircraft flying between two EU capitals in order to arrest a young journalist and his partner on board the plane. This act endangered the safety of the passengers on board, which is guaranteed by international law. The purpose was to silence Raman Pratasevich, a 26-year-old independent journalist who had played an important role in promoting independent media in Belarus. He and his partner, Sofia Sepeda, are now in prison. This is unfortunately not a unique case, but is part of a broader picture. In Belarus, over the last 10 months, the attacks on free media have intensified. The authorities continue to detain and use violence against journalists and media workers, revoking their media credentials, raiding their homes and offices, and imposing fines and long prison sentences on politically motivated charges. Nearly all independent media outlets and news agencies have suffered from harassment by the authorities. For example, on the 18th of May last, the domain of Belarus's most popular news website, tut.by, whose audience accounts for two thirds of the country's internet users, was blocked. This is part of the Belarusian regime's increasingly brutal repression of its own citizens. There are now 
more than 500 political prisoners in the country. There is systematic use of torture in prisons and evidence has been collected in more than 2,000 cases. The repression also includes amendments of the national legislation, such as the adoption of provisions to designate members of the political opposition as terrorists, which entails extremely severe sentences, including potentially the death penalty. The UN Human Rights Council has established a robust examination mandate that will assist in holding perpetrators of human rights violations accountable. Alongside with the mandate of the UN High Commissioner, the renewal of the mandate of the UN Special Rapporteur on the situation of human rights in Belarus is also essential to address this dire situation. We must demand conditions allowing all persons in Belarus to exercise their fundamental rights such as freedom of opinion, expression and peaceful assembly. We must end human rights violations and assist the Belarusian population in building a society based on the rule of law. The EU stands united to support the people of Belarus in cooperation with our international partners and we fully support that both Belarus and freedom of opinion and expression should be currently among the central themes of the Human Rights Council sessions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, a permanent delegation of uh, European Union. Um, I welcome um, permanent mission of Denmark right now, uh, followed by permanent mission of Estonia. You have the floor. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, when the demonstrations in Belarus began last summer, courageous journalists and photographers gave the Belarusian people a voice and a face. They also gave the rest of the world eyes and ears on the ground. What we saw was the largest demonstrations in the modern history of Belarus. We saw a frustrated population that took the streets to have a say about their own future. We saw them demand respect for their human rights and fundamental freedoms. And we watched when the regime attempted to arrest, torture and intimidate its own population into silence. Since then, the space for media freedom has only come under further attack. In May, we witnessed the harsh and arbitrary crackdown on the independent media site TUT. We watched with disbelief as a regime forced down a commercial aircraft to arrest next her founder, Oman Podashevich and Sofia Sapega. This act showed just how far the regime is willing to go to silence all critical voices. My thoughts go to Mr. Podashevich's parents. I thank them warmly for their participation here today. Rest assured that we will continue to call for his immediate release along with there are over 400 other political prisoners in Belarus. Reports from courageous Belarusian journalists prompted me together with colleagues from Germany and the UK to support the establishment of the International Accountability Platform for Belarus. Since then, many more have joined in support, along with the work of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. The work is essential for the pursuit of accountability for the perpetrators of human rights violations in Belarus and the justice for the victims. I thank you. Thank you, Permanent Mission of Denmark. Uh, now uh, we will be listening to uh, the statement by Permanent Mission of Estonia, followed by Permanent Mission of Latvia. You have the floor. Distinguished panelists, dear colleagues, Estonia shares the deep concerns about the deteriorating human rights situation in general and the alarming situation of media freedom in Belarus. We witness increasingly brutal attacks by the authorities against journalists and media workers and a criminal prosecution simply for doing their job. These are repressive campaigns by the authorities to silence independent voices in Belarus. On 18th of May, the offices of the independent news site Tutbai were raided and more than a dozen of staff members were arrested. In the course of the 9th of August elections and its aftermath, 
more than 400 journalists and media workers have faced various forms of repression. These shocking actions, among others, constitute a serious attack on media freedom and have serious implications for the freedom of expression and opinion more broadly. We condemn all violations of human rights as well as the denial of the right to freedom of opinion and expression, both online and offline, and increasing restrictions on independent media actors by the Belarusian authorities. As a member of the United Nations Security Council, we have organized two high-level area formula meetings on the situation on Belarus. The first meeting took place on the 4th of September 2020, focusing on human rights in Belarus. The second meeting took place on the 22nd of January this year and focused on media freedom in Belarus. We will draw attention to serious violations of media freedom also at the Global Conference on Media Freedom taking place in December this year in Tallinn. Estonia urges the international community to react adequately to the deteriorating situation of human rights and the environment for journalists, media workers, human rights defenders and other members of the civil society in Belarus. To show this, the Human Rights Council members could render strong support to the resolution at the upcoming session extending the mandate of the Special Rapporteur on the human rights situation in Belarus. This would send a strong signal to the authorities of Belarus that the international community is watching. The international community cannot remain a silent bystander to the grave human rights violations in Belarus. There needs to be consequences. There needs to be accountability. Thank you. Thank you, permanent uh, mission of Estonia. Now we have a statement by a permanent mission of Latvia followed by the permanent mission of Poland. You have the floor. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues. Today's debate on the human rights crisis in Belarus is very timely and needed. Thanks to my Lithuanian colleague and all the co-sponsors of this event. Ten months have passed since the rigged presidential elections in Belarus. We continue witnessing manifest and unprecedented breach of human rights and fundamental freedoms for Belarusian people. Media outlets and journalists have become a prime target. The situation continues to deteriorate. Hijacking of Ryanair flight in Minsk on 23rd May and arrest alleged torture on first confession of social media activist Roman Protasevich is another manifestation of Lukashenko's regime's blatant attack at freedom of media and freedom of expression. The reaction by the majority of the international community was immediate and crystal clear. Yet, further international action is an urgent necessity. We, the United Nations Member States, have a shared responsibility to focus on very practical support for Belarusian media inside and outside the country. They need our help to survive and to continue doing their work. Latvia has already been providing practical support to Belarusian independent journalists and media workers. They receive rehabilitation services, psychological and safety training. Colleagues, human rights abuses cannot go unpunished and their perpetrators must be held to account. As we recently stated at the UN Group of Friends for Protection of Journalists, there can be no press freedom when there is a fear. We need to find ways to support the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights in establishing effective accountability mechanism for Belarus. We must conduct comprehensive examination of alleged human rights violations committed in the country. We repeat our call upon the Belarusian authorities to immediately release Roman Protasevich as well as all other journalists and political prisoners. We urge the Belarusian authorities to follow and cooperate in the implementation of the recommendations of the OECE Moscow mechanism. As an UN member state, Belarus has an obligation to respect its international obligations and protect the rights of its own citizens. Thank you very much. I thank um, the permanent mission of Latvia and welcome permanent mission 
um, of Poland, followed by permanent mission of Estonia. You have the floor. Excellencies, let me start by thanking my Lithuanian friend, Minister Gabrielius Landsbergis, for convening this important event on the margins of the Human Rights Council. I am honored to add some remarks from the perspective of Poland. During its previous session in March 2021, the Council established a new fact-finding mechanism for the massive violations of human rights which have been taking place in Belarus since the last year's presidential elections. Subsequently, the situation in Belarus has dramatically deteriorated, escalating from one week to another. Already in March, the Belarusian authorities started to arrest or even convict a number of representatives of the Polish national minority. These people were not involved in the political life. They only cultivated their traditions, language and culture. Since May, an intensified campaign against independent media resulted in the closure of the information portal to Dubai and in further arrests and fines imposed on journalists. On May 23rd, the international community was shocked by the arrest of the dissident blogger Raman Pratasiewicz and his partner after a civil aircraft forced emergency landing in Minsk. Their later staged TV appearances and forced confessions are highly disturbing and clearly reflect the inhuman treatment of both detainees. These are but a few examples of the dire situation of human rights in Belarus, caused by the repressive actions of the state authorities. Poland reiterates its call on Belarus to refrain from further human rights violations and stop prosecuting journalists, media workers and all targeted groups of the society. We urge the Belarusian authorities to release political prisoners already counted in hundreds. Among them, more than 20 journalists and media workers, including Raman Pratasiewicz, TV Bielsat journalist Kaczarina Andrieva and Daria Czultsova, leaders of the Union of Poles in Belarus, Angelika Boris and Andrzej Pochobut, a journalist himself. Ladies and gentlemen, media freedom and human rights are strongly interconnected. I declare Poland's firm commitment to further assist independent media serving Belarusian people who proved in the last months their highest dedication to democratic values. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Permanent Mission um, of Poland. And now we're going to hear the Permanent Mission of Slovakia. Ladies and gentlemen, freedom of media is not about politics, but about basic principles of democracy and the respect of human rights. Journalism is not only a profession, but also a mission to uncover the truth, however unpleasant it can be for the powerful ones. After rigged presidential elections, the safety of journalists and the freedom of the media in Belarus are under massive attack. The overall situation is deeply concerning as the basic principles of democracy are violated and the brutality of the Belarusian regime is increasing. Slovakia is concerned about the situation of media representatives in particular. They continue to face arbitrary detentions, ill treatment, torture, and forced disappearances, and other forms of oppression. Journalists are arbitrarily prosecuted after on baseless grounds, and internet freedoms have been further restricted by the government. As stated by reporters without borders, all of this makes Belarus the most dangerous country for journalists in Europe. As a member of the Media Freedom Coalition, 
Slovakia has joined the statement of the UN Group of Friends for the Protection of Journalists on the situation in Belarus, urging Belarus not to use purported national security concerns as a pretext to deny individuals their human rights and fundamental freedoms. We are strengthening our support of the civil society in Belarus, both through financial and non-financial instruments. Some of the initiatives Slovakia has sponsored were directly aimed at empowering independent media and journalists, while others aimed at enhancing the participation of students and civil society as a whole. Dear colleagues, Human Rights Council must continue to pay close attention to human rights situation in Belarus. Slovakia stands ready to assist Belarus in seeking a peaceful and democratic solution to the current crisis. We fully support all UN-led efforts in achieving this crucial goal that the people of Belarus long for and deserve. We believe independent, vibrant, free and pluralistic media represent one of the cornerstones to build democratic institutions and resilient society. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, permanent mission of uh, Slovakia. And now we have a few minutes left for interventions. I will shortly turn uh, to permanent mission of Austria, followed by the permanent mission of Germany. I just want to take this moment to thank our co-sponsors of today's event on behalf of Pan America, permanent mission of Lithuania and Human Rights House Foundation, including the permanent mission of uh, in Geneva of Denmark, Estonia, Latvia, Norway, Poland, Slovakia, United States, and the permanent delegation of European Union. So now, permanent mission of Austria, you have the floor. Thank you very much for giving me the floor and uh, congratulations to all the organizers and thank you for organizing this event. I think the very impressive list of high ranking speakers speaks for itself for the importance and the urgency of this topic. The fact that we could listen to journalists helped us get first-hand information about what is going on on the ground and helps us to have a better understanding and a clear picture of what is happening. The rule of law and fundamental freedoms have come under unprecedented and severe attack in Belarus. Journalists and media workers are particularly affected by this repression. As other speakers have said, um, the, this was recently illustrated by the scandalous forced landing of a civilian aircraft in order to arrest the journalist and his partner on board of the plane, uh, an unprecedented intervention. And let us be very clear about the value of free media. If journalists are intimidated, prosecuted and arrested, who will ensure the free flow of information? Who will hold a government accountable? And how will confidence and trust be built in the institutions of the state? A free and independent press and a thriving civil society are prerequisites for the proper functioning of government and public services, for maintaining peace and security nationally and internationally. Being intimidated, prosecuted or detained for exercising the right of freedom of expression cannot be tolerated. Let me therefore reiterate our calls on the Belarusian authorities to respect and uphold the freedom of expression online and offline and to immediately release and rehabilitate all journalists and media workers, including bloggers. Thank you. Thank you, uh, permanent mission of Austria. And uh, now we're going to hear from permanent mission of Germany. You have the floor. Yeah, thank you very much. And um, before I would um, like to issue some remarks, I would like to thank Lithuania as well as the Human Rights House Foundation for organizing this timely event, as well as the additional co-sponsors for their support. Let me reassure you, Germany and the European Union stand with the Belarusian people in their peaceful quest for freedom and democracy and the respect for human rights, despite the violence and harassment, especially against journalists and media workers with the crackdown on independent media outlets uh, to dot by being just the tip of the iceberg. The High Commissioner has the report in March, as well as the new report of the Special Rapporteur, Ms. Marine 
identify an unprecedented human rights crisis and an atmosphere of fear. Whenever we think we have reached the low point in the human rights situation in Belarus, there is a further deterioration. The wholly unacceptable forced landing of the Ryanair flight, as well as the recent broadcast footage with Raman Patasevich and Sofia Sapega stand exemplary in that regard. The international community needs to respond to this injustice. This is why the European Union will present a resolution to extend the mandate for the special rapporteur on Belarus. We have imposed sanctions against Lukashenko and his regime. And we have set up an action plan civil society Belarus with up to 21 million euro to support civil society in Belarus. We have also set up mechanisms to collect evidence against those who violate human rights. It is now up to the authorities in Minsk to change the course and reverse the dynamic. Our core demands remain the same. End of violence and repression, release of political prisoners, genuine and inclusive national dialogue. However, this goal also requires a strong civil society and courageous people like you who stand up for the rights of all Belarusians and we assure you of our support. Thank you. Thank you, uh, permanent mission of uh, Germany. Um, it seems to me that we don't really have uh, more time for questions or interventions right now. And I just want to make a few final remarks uh, before we conclude. Together with many human rights defenders, Pan America and Human Rights House Foundation have been continuously raising awareness about the grave human rights violations that have been ongoing in Belarus since August 2020. In the last few months, interest in Belarus from the international community was visibly flagging. The swift and serious response of the US, EU, UK, Canada, and others to the Belarusians uh, hitchhacking a plane to arrest a blogger was reassuring, but it also demonstrates the importance of acting before the most egregious uh, violations occur. We, as the international community, cannot afford to neglect the situation in Belarus anymore, because if we do so, next time we won't have any media worker, artist or human rights defender remain free in Belarus to talk with. We're deeply grateful for the de demonstration of support from the many missions that co-sponsored today's event, which sends an important signal of solidarity in defense of human rights and press freedom in Belarus. As a critical next step, Pan America, the Human Rights House Foundation, and our Belarusian civil society colleagues urge the Human Rights Council member states to assist the Council in making the decision to extend the mandate of a special rapporteur on the human rights situation in Belarus, and to promote accountability for the serious human rights violations that are happening in the country. I, remind delegations that Pan America and Human Rights House Foundation are available to help provide further independent information to you about the human rights and cultural rights in Belarus as needed. I finish by thanking all of our panelists, particularly our Belarusian colleagues facing enormous challenges uh, right now. I thank the permanent mission of Lithuania and Human Rights House Foundation as co-organizers of this event and all of the co-sponsors again. Thank you to our interpreters for their hard work as well. And I wish you all a good day and successful Human Rights Council session to all the missions. Thank you.